Hello my friends, this is the Retro Guy. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about this machine here. This is my 6100 uh, Power Mac with the DOS compatible card, which is this guy here. I'm, uh, I'm going to work a little bit on that. I'm going to show you what it is. I'm going to show you the components of it and how it fits into the machine. Then I'm going to just basically put everything back together and we are going to do a little test drive on it. So normally on my videos, I don't really do test drives. It's more like fixing stuff or showing off like uh, stuff that I have. And I think it lacks this part of actually showing you what those vintage or old computers can actually do. I know this has been done by some other YouTubers and uh, that's fine because I think each one does in a different way. And I'm going to do on my way. So, um, as always, I'm sitting on the ground, as you can see. So uh, I prefer actually working like that because I have plenty of space in my floor here. Uh, instead of using my bench, that's just the way I prefer. It has enough lighting as well, so I can basically see what I'm doing. But uh, the idea here today is not really to fix or to uh, mess around with uh, circuits or soldering or anything like that. It's really more like uh, showing you a little bit about this uh, magnificent card and what can be done with it. Before I go ahead with that, I'm actually going to install on this machine a uh, SCSI 2ST. So I removed the SCSI drive and I basically going to add this SCSI 2ST. This one I bought from Amiga Kit. Uh, you can uh, look it up on the on the Google or internet. It's the cheapest one available if you actually look for it. Uh, if you go to eBay, for example, it's going to cost you more. If you go anywhere else, is it? It's going to cost you more. So this one here, the version of it, is. It used to be written on the circuit, but not able to find it. So I have been. I have this one here since a long time, uh, more than two years now but I never really used it. So I don't know the version of this particular one. We have to basically power it up and actually see it. Uh, I didn't actually did any configuration here. It's a stock, I tested it, it works. I have already like a, an SD formatted with all the files that I had in the SCSI plus some more. So it should be ready to go. Again, like I test everything um, offline before installing it. And I'm just going to do the, uh, the final installation. So this guy will be ready to go. So um, basically what I'm going to do is mount this card on the uh, SCSI drive mountings that I, uh, we have here. So the original SCSI drive was here and I'm basically going to mount this guy on top of this. So there is some gapping here that I think I can address if I add some little bit of padding uh, the, the board is mounted here. I'm going to now basically sh um, sh uh, insert the mounting into the bracket here. And we should be good to go in terms of the SCSI 2SD. So let's do that. Should be fairly straightforward. Like this, just keep going. Yeah, just like adding a hard drive to the system until it clicks like this and it's uh, basically very firm and mounted, right? So there's not much else to do here. So before I uh, connect the cables here, I have to add the, the DOS compatible card into the system. So let's talk a little bit about it. So hopefully you guys can see it. Uh, there is basically a, uh, there is a new boost uh, slot here. For the 6100, the slot is slightly different than the ones that you have on the other computers. So it's not the, um, I don't know the name, but uh, it's, it's different basically. It looks like um, basically a PCI slot to be really honest, but it isn't. It is a PDS slash Nubus uh, sort of uh, interface and it's just like the connector that is different. So as you can see here, this is basically the face that is going to be added to the connector itself. And it's uh, it's really, it reminds a little bit of a PCI sort of card, but uh, it isn't again, right? So about the card itself. So this card here, 
basically is a PC on a card. So this guy has a processor, which in this case here is a 486, if I remember correctly. So it's a 40, uh, 486 uh, DX2 uh, or DX4. Don't really remember the exact uh, type of processor that is in here, but I'm pretty sure it's, uh, it, it's Intel for sure. It's not Cyrix or anything like that. And it's not a Pentium, so um, it has to be like a 486 uh, DX2 maybe. Uh, in here, you have all the circuitry, you know, you see like uh, chips and technologies. So basically, uh, the chipset is chips and technologies and technology. And uh, here you have like the RAM uh, slot. So you can add RAM directly onto this board here. If you don't add RAM here, it is going to be shared with the Mac. And this is, of course, not going to be ideal in terms of performance. So if you had a RAM stick, you can just uh, put it here and you get like dedicated RAM to run. Uh, with this particular card. In here is uh, this daughter card that you see on top here is a Sound Blaster compatible card. So it, it even has a Sound Blaster card uh, available in terms of hardware. It's not emulator or anything like that. And then here you have the connectors to basically feed the audio onto the speakers of the system here. So it's connecting to the uh, Mac soundboard and it's also coming to the CD. So my machine has a CD-ROM so it basically the CD-ROM feeds its audio onto this um, connector here. So I can basically listen to music here while running Windows 95, for example. This board has, of course, limitations. Uh, in terms of performance, it basically never going to be as great as a dedicated PC. And the reason being the video is uh, has some shared components if compared to a dedicated one. So we are sharing the video with the Mac and that of course causes some um, performance issues. It's still enough to run Doom for example and some other games, so I'm going to show you that, but uh, not 100% uh, ideal still because of the lack of dedicated video circuitry. Uh, what else? Um, so in terms of compatibility, this card here was uh, originally designed to actually fit the 6100 models. And it was back in the days where there was um, this big pressure of Apple to basically, you know, push their computers into schools. And uh, at that time, schools were basically like uh, struggling between like the Macs and the PCs. So PCs were coming on strong into the educational market as well. And some schools, basically, they already had some PCs in place. And uh, they had this issue with, okay, so if we're going to replace PCs with the Macs, how are we going to port our software? You know, we, we don't want to go and buy everything again. So uh, Apple basically said, uh, no need to. We are now going to provide you with this option where you can basically use the software that you already have in the Mac natively without the need to add any specific, uh, you know, like... Um, uh, portability elements or uh, running into performance issues or anything like that. So that was basically the main point, uh, making this compatible with uh, uh, DOS computers at the time so that both uh, schools and businesses could see this as a very good uh, contendent. So uh, I really don't know whether or not this worked, this strategy, so maybe I should have done a little more research on that. I haven't. But um, that was mainly the main selling point of this card. This card wasn't cheap. Uh, it was actually fairly expensive, but uh, way cheaper than actually buying a brand new uh, DOS computer, for example. Uh, what else? That's pretty much it. Like this card is not compatible. It, it, there are some machines that can actually have this card installed as well. As you can see here, this is uh, basically the Razer card that fits into the 6100 so that the card basically lays down flat like uh, like this, you're going to see in a moment. But uh, there is an option that you can basically get rid of this uh, uh, raising card here. And you can just put the card uh, in a vertical way so that it would fit some quadra computers and some other computers at the time. So there are um, some selected machines that could actually run this card here. Not all of the machines will, uh, the, with the PDS bus will basically be compatible with that. So there is a list available on many websites that basically says which ones are compatible with that. So 
uh, what do you need to run this besides having the compatible uh, Macintosh that will host it? You have to have the white cable. So there is a white cable that basically connects on the back here. And this, uh, it's, a, it's called a white cable because it has basically, you connect one end here, and then there are basically two ends that goes uh, out of this. One end connects to the monitor. The other end is for, it's a joy, joystick port, basically for you to connect like a joystick compatible uh, PC. Uh, that didn't come out uh, right. So a uh, uh, PC compatible joystick into this port here. So that was the plan at least, right? So um, without the white cable, I think there are still ways for you to get this to work, uh, but it's a little bit tricky and it basically relies on you basically assembling your own cable based on the pinouts and stuff like that. So it's not easy at all. Not very f uh, easy to find those cards either. Uh, if you look it up at eBay and places like that, uh, it's a bit rare actually for you to come across those, uh, especially with the white cable. So uh, when I got this here, I got actually the whole set uh, a while ago, I think around maybe two years ago or something like that. And uh, I found a guy basically selling this at eBay. He actually did like some recap work here as well. So the machine was basically good to go. It was just requiring some cleaning. And uh, I paid quite a lot of money actually at the time. I think maybe like uh, 150 quid or something like that. It's not really a lot. Uh, I would actually pay more for a machine like this, but uh, it, it's much more than normally I pay for used Macs at eBay. So it was way above my normal range uh, for acquiring computers at eBay. And uh, everything was working perfectly. And uh, so nothing to complain about really. Uh, one other thing that I forgot to mention is the design uh, is not really uh, the best one. So Apple, when uh, they did this, right, this card here, the card itself is uh, very well designed. As you can see, very compact and uh, well designed. But the problem is, there is no ventilation. So basically you see the 486 processor basically gets aligned with the PowerPC processor here. And uh, there is a big problem in terms of heating. So if you're running Doom, for example, like 3D games, that eventually will overheat the whole thing. So what normally people did is adding like a fan internally here to make air flow between like the two processors. So that was a design flaw uh, that Apple basically made when creating those. If you're just running spreadsheets and stuff like that, I think it should be fine. It's just gaming that really uh, can create some issues. So to install the card, you have to make sure that, uh, you know, the audio uh, components are connected like it is here. And then just flipping this around and make sure that uh, you are not going to uh, clip any of the cables right and then carefully align those tabs uh, there is one tab, metal tab here that goes on the side and then of course you have to align that with a slot so that it clicks into, into place so it's not really too hard but it requires some attention to get this done properly Okay, so I think one of the things that I used to love about, uh, so actually I was thinking here that maybe before adding the board, I'm actually going to connect this SCSI interface here because it's going to be a little bit tight if I try to do that afterwards. So let's connect this SCSI to SD here, plug everything in. And now I can basically move the wires up a little bit, make it space for this board to fit right underneath it. So yes, back to what I was saying about uh, Jason's Macintosh Museum channel. One of the things that I, <laughs> he quit me out, you know, in the, some of his videos is, uh, normally he disassembled pretty much everything that he was showing, which is great because it really, you get to, to see uh, the internals and how difficult it is actually to uh, disassemble uh, some of those elements 
and so on and so forth. So whenever I'm in doubt, you know, uh, on how to disassemble some of those computers, uh, that channel really makes me um, more comfortable in working with those. It shows me exactly how to proceed, basically. So I really like it. Uh, but one thing that creeps me out is that Jason, uh, he just, uh, like, I, sometimes when he's uh, disassembling stuff, he doesn't seem to be very careful, you know, like, and uh, those very old machines with very brittle plastic cases and stuff like that, sometimes they don't really take the impact of uh, you just, you know, like uh, lifting it up or, you know, being now not too careful, let's put it like that. And that really creeped me out. But uh, he never broke any of those computers, amazingly. Like every time that he um, disassembled everything, nothing breaks. And uh, he always managed to put everything back together. So that, that to me is amazing, really. Okay, so enough of that. So this is basically how it looks like when it's mounted. So the uh, DOS card in its slot here, it's, uh, the, the SCSI cable actually runs on top of it has to be like that because again of the CPU alignment that is just here. So if the SCSI cable is actually underneath, it's going to be exactly in the alignment of the two CPUs and uh, that will cause all sorts of issues if not even breaking the, uh, the CPU. Uh, eventually like because you're forcing the cable into the hole, eventually it will split the, um, the cooling uh, system that is in here, the, the passive cooling. So it might not be a good idea. So those cables that you see here are basically the audio cables, so hence the mass. And uh, that's pretty much it. There is nothing else here. So what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm basically going to, you have to, uh, again, if you're lucky enough, you're going to get also the pins to secure the card in place here. Uh, otherwise the card is going to be wobbly. And whenever you're going to, you know, uh, adding the cable or removing it, there is a chance that uh, the card is going to disconnect from the main CPU. So it's really not a good idea to keep moving this card around because again of the CPU alignment. So um, it has to be steady in place. So I this here, uh, when I bought it, it didn't have those um, those mounting screws. So I basically got those from I think an old. Um, what was that? I think a serial cable that I had in the past, so they are perfectly compatible. So it's not the end of the world if you got this without the, the pins. You can easily find those screws, those screws elsewhere. Okay, so it's in. Now I try to make sure that this is tight enough, but not too tight because again, like uh, if you tight this too much, the plastic here could break and you don't want that. So at least today I'm using like uh, a good sock, you see, no holes or anything. So that's a good thing. Okay, so um, that's pretty much it guys, like the cord is installed now, it's just a matter of uh, closing the case and uh, Connecting all the cables back together, plugging this in, powering it on, and uh, and then demo this uh, so you guys can see. So I'm running Windows 5, uh, 95 here. Even though the card was designed to run DOS only, it fully supports Windows 95. There are some caveats of doing that. In my case, for example, it's the shutdown process that doesn't go through. Like everything else worked perfectly, but the shutdown process when you're running Windows 95 for some reason doesn't go all the way through. So it sticks on the shutting down process, it never shows me that screen that says it's now safe to turn off your computer, which is not a big thing if you're using a SCSI to SD, so the chances of the files get, getting corrupted or anything like that is lower than in a regular drive, but um, still there is a chance of uh, some Windows 95 files getting corrupted over time if you keep doing that. That's why I have a backup of the virtual drive that runs uh, the DOS and Windows things. So that if uh, anything happens, I have a copy of those and plenty of space here to basically keep, you know, replicating this over. So let me close the case now. One piece of advice, if you guys ever, you know, work with those uh, old 6100, is those back tabs here. 
very easy to break. So um, unfortunately, in my case here, it's beginning to crack already. So, and there is no nice way to reinforce this other than uh, from, the, uh, from the back, which I already done. So maybe it's time to do that again, but since I don't intend to open this again, I'll just leave it as it is for now. And uh, hopefully it should be strong enough to at least hold uh, the cover in place. So close it. Again, to close, you have to be a little bit careful here. It's very easy to break those. As you can see here, it's already like coming off. See? So eventually it's going to detach. And um, so yeah, I might use some super glue here. Maybe now, you know, like, otherwise it's going to be a pain for me to uh, remove this again from where it's going to be and uh, doing that later on. I'm going to do this now because this eventually is going to um, completely detach from the case and I'm going to eventually lose that, uh, you know, behind the cupboard or something like that. So I'm going to use some super glue here and make sure it's uh, reinforced enough to hold uh, at least for until the next time. Uh, the Mac is uh, back in its place with all its glory and ready to go. I have to lower the resolution here a little bit so the flickering wasn't that bad. So looking at the, the screen that I have right now from the mobile phone that I have, it looks fairly stable, so it looks okay. Uh, so I'm using here a Sony monitor, a Trinitron monitor. It's a multi-scan 420DS, which is an amazing monitor. The quality of the image is stunning. So really, really nice. And uh, the onboard graphics card for this 6100 supports up to thousands uh, colors in this mode here, 6040, uh, 640 by 4480. Uh, if I go to the higher resolution mode here, then I have up to 256 colors. Just, uh, you know, out of curiosity here. So let me close that. And uh, so in terms of the Mac itself, so this one has 72 megs of RAM. So it's, uh, it's a good configuration. Uh, it's running system uh, 8.5. It doesn't really matter for the DOS compatibility software so i think it supports uh, older versions and also higher versions so it doesn't really matter for that and if i go to the system profile here it should be able to detect the card so let's check that so here's the system profiler and if i go to devices and volumes here i should be able to see it on the nubus option here there is a nubus card detected if I expand that, I can see that it is a Macintosh PC PDS card and version of the card is 1.1, which if I'm not mistaken, this is the latest version for this particular platform. So there you have it. We do have the card detected. So it's now a matter of launching the software to restart the PC mode. So there are, there are basically two ways for us to do that. Uh, one is using the control panel here. So if I double click it, I have the PC setup options. So I have here the two hard drives or virtual hard drives that I'm using. Those are basically images that were placed on the uh, Mac disk. So if I go to Mac OS here, I should see those disk images here. So one is here, as you can see, right? And the other should be down below. Uh, the great thing about this uh, method is that I can basically uh, back up those in the hard drive itself or outside of the computer, like in a zip drive or something like that. And uh, if something goes bad with those virtual hard drives, I can just replace them very, very easily. It's a matter of copying and pasting them back. So that's really, really convenient. Uh, so you get uh, to also map some sharing uh, uh, file systems on your uh, Mac so that the PC can actually seize it and vice versa. So it can, it's, it makes it easier to move files between the two systems, basically. So uh, same goes for modern and uh, serial ports. So you get actually to map those to use the physical ports on the Mac if needed to use a modem, for example, or something like that. Of course, this is not the case anymore. And uh, whether or not to enable sound and 
whether or not you want to uh, start already into the PC mode automatically whenever you boot up the Mac. So this might be, uh, it should have been like a popular option in the past. Again, like for um, companies that were basically switching from PCs back to Macs or something like that. So they wanted to start on PC mode uh, because they were running uh, DOS software. And then little by little, they started basically to migrate back to the Mac. So it could be. Uh, something like that, I think. So if I click on Start PC here, this will cause the uh, PC board basically to start up, like a, a, P, a PC inside of the Mac, really. And uh, switching to the PC mode, I can just click that button and that will cause it to go like that. I could also use the hotkey combination here, which is Command Return. That will cause the Mac to... Uh, switch to PC mode and uh, that, that's really it like uh, there is not nothing too special about it so uh, the control panel is on which means that if I actually use the hotkey combination here that should uh, cause the system to go to DOS mode so let me just use that you cannot see my keyboard here but I'm pressing the Apple button and or the command button and the enter key and that switches on to DOS mode So yeah, I think I've got a problem with the resolution here. So let me switch back to Mac. So I'm back to Mac now. So I think when I changed the resolution here uh, on the Mac, it basically affected the, the PC. So let me shut down the PC here. So it shut down the card and uh, so yeah, I might want to try this as well. So let's see. So let's try to uh, use the VGA mode here. And again, let's do the switch. So you start PC and switch to it. Yeah, still I got nothing. Like the monitor is not picking up the signal of the video. It was working before, um, but uh, I never tested after changing the resolution on the Mac. So let me go back to the Mac mode again. And uh, final test here will be the Apple 16 option. And again, switch to PC. And apparently I still get nothing, yeah. So yeah, that's a little bit frustrating. So let me go back to Mac here. And what I'm going to do now is switch back to the resolution here. To the higher one so it might start getting some little more flickering around a little bit more as I can see still visible so that's good so let's try again switch back to PC and see what we have yeah I got nothing still so that's not good So let's put this back the way it was and uh, shut down the PC and then give it another, another shot. Oh, come on. Yeah, this is bad. So it was working before. I tested it after, you know, putting the PC, uh, the Mac back. And uh, it was booting just fine. So it happened after I switched uh, down the resolution, basically. Which is, uh, it's pretty frustrating. So it doesn't say, uh, at least the software running on the Mac doesn't detect any issues or anything. So it could be just a matter of, uh, you know, monitor frequency compatibility or something like that. Again, it was working just fine. And it's really, really frustrating, this. No. I'm going to shut down everything and, uh, and mess around with the cables and see if uh, that changes anything. Okay, some new developments here. I uh, removed the chip, you know, the processor from the, uh, the DOS card. So this is a DX2 not the X4. And uh, the problem when I uh, 
open it and I look at the card is uh, it was very, very, very hot. So it could be that the system was on and the card, this is a known problem on those cards based on what I mentioned before. Uh, there is poor ventilation. There is uh, not really like active flowing of air inside of the machine because of the lack of uh, proper fun. And uh, this really causes an issue. So uh, what I'm going to do here is uh, basically, uh, this is the original paste that was on the on the processor. I'm going to remove it with uh, isopropyl alcohol and I'm going to reflow it. So I have like a fresh paste here. I'm just going to reflow it, uh, reassemble everything and test it again. So I'm pretty confident that it will work after I've, I finish this, this work here. This is the cleaned processor. As you can see, it looks much better now. Uh, I bent some of the legs when I was removing the processor from the connector. So I tried to realign them properly, but uh, no, I hate this type of thing because um, if they are not fully aligned and you try to force them into place, then eventually some of those legs will break or get uh, very badly bent. And you don't really want that. So I have to be extra careful here. So what I'm going to do now, so this is uh, the heatsink already also cleaned from the old paste. Uh, as you can see, the heatsink is not big enough. It's very, very uh, low profile, but there is not much I can do here. If I add like a, a higher heatsink here, it will basically collapse with the uh, power PC processor because as I showed you before, one goes pretty much like uh, in the hole of the other. And uh, that's pretty much all the space you have. Again, with the problem with the design of this board, which is not ideal really, like uh, there is no airflow. And uh, if uh, depending on how you're using those uh, cards, again, it's going to uh, overheat at some point and cease to work until you it goes down to the regular temperature and so on and so forth. I'm pretty sure like uh, re re reflowing the paste here will be of some uh, benefit. Come on, how do I open this? So I'm basically going to reflow it with uh, fresh paste that I have as soon as I can get this open, of course. It's a bit tough to open this. There. Okay, there you have it. So let me, uh, the trick is not to put a lot of paste, as you know, just a, a little blob here and then put the heat sink and the heat sink is going to take care of basically spreading this around, right? So a little bit of paste in the middle here. Like that should be enough, I think. So let me... So what you really want is just a very thin layer of this uh, heat paste, thermal paste that I put. So I have to align the, the heat sink here now. So I have to make note of where this end here is. Otherwise I will, well, I can look it from the other side as well. Okay, so yeah, it's making full contact with the surface, which is okay. So now I have to just put uh, the heatsink lock in place here. And uh, you know, hope for the best when I place that back to the board so that any uh, no legs are going to basically be uh, bent or anything like that. So I can really hope for the best here, not much I can do. Okay, so this is the mounted chip. So we have the processor with the heatsink and braces basically holding this together as it, if it were like a one piece sort of thing. Uh, checking the alignment here of the legs. They look kind of okay. 
So next step is try to push this onto the board. So that's basically what I'm going to try to attempt now. Hopefully with success. So this is basically the board. This is where the chip or the processor must go. So there is here the uh, identification of uh, the part that has... So this is basically how it should align. So this part here that has a little, you know, like a mark should go here. So I'm going to place the processor in the pins. So I should feel them basically getting into the holes. Not really feeling that right now. So there are still some basically pins that are not fully aligned. So I have to make it, make it this a little bit better. So Again, like if they are not perfectly aligned and you try to force it, some of those little legs might break or get even worse. Okay, now it seems to be kind of okay. Yeah. I think it's in. So it seems at least. Yeah, if uh, one of the legs were like uh, bent or anything like it, I will have uh, probably I would be able to see it. So I'm not a hundred percent sure that this is fine. So looking here, I can basically see that no legs are bent or misplaced. So I think we should be okay. Yeah, we look, it seems we are fine. Okay, yeah, the problem is uh, this heatsink here, you know, like because the, the clamps basically go underneath the processor, it basically makes, uh, it creates this little gap here, you see, between the processor and uh, the connector. And uh, and there is not nothing really I can do about it because I cannot replace this heat sink here so i have to keep the play the, the clamps in place and everything else and uh yeah it's not ideal but that's what i can do i can see that the paste is basically going spreading all the way to the end here <coughs> which tells me that i might have used a little too much but still like uh, it's a good signal because it shows me that the whole area now is covered with the paste so it should be okay in terms of the, the thermal um, the thermal exchange point of view at least <clears throat> so I'm going to try to push this a little bit higher down okay so there's not much I can do much else I can do here so now is we sit in the board onto the main uh, the main board on the Mac and testing it and really hoping for the best there is not much more I can do here okay so I'm going to do that now I'm going to reassemble everything and then I'm going to start recording again so hopefully you guys will be able to see the DOS card working so by the way could I uh, change the processor here yes as long as it is compatible with uh, the socket, you can replace that. So people have uh, basically replaced this with, uh, there are other, other uh, Intel options that you can actually put here. They are a little, a little bit faster than this one. And also Cyrix uh, processors that are also compatible here and equivalent to like a 586 uh, sort of processors that are fairly faster than this one. 
The problem again is heat. So it doesn't really like uh, make sense to put a faster processor here if the heat is not going to be dissipated properly. So having a, a higher, uh, hey, uh, yeah, maybe uh, like having a higher uh, speed processor here, higher clock speed, uh, clock processor here, is it could become an issue in terms of the heat dissipation. So if we are already having issues with the 4086, uh, 4086DX2, imagine if this was like a 586 or something like that. So that's why I never consider replacing the processor here. It should be in like an easy thing to do, uh, even in terms of uh, costly wise, it should not be too expensive. But again, um, chances are if you do it, the board is going to start behaving a little more erratic and uh, unstable. So that's why I never done it. So let me put that back in, test it uh, with you guys uh, filming everything and let's hope for the best. Okay, so after a bit of freaking out, I managed to find what the problem was. It wasn't with the card at all, so it wasn't a hardware issue. So uh, when I disabled the um, virtual memory on the on the settings, on the memory settings, for some reason, uh, the DOS card did that to work. So disabling that caused uh, the system to not starting up properly. And uh, I mean the DOS system on the card. And uh, that was the reason for the black screen. So I didn't have to basically disassemble the whole thing, as you can see here, like I have the Mac open here and uh, all sorts of mess. But I didn't have to do that. It was just a matter of re-enabling the virtual memory and everything should be back as it should. I, I don't know why the card needs the shared memory enabled. Not the shared memory, sorry, the virtual memory enabled. To me, it doesn't make much sense. Again, like I have a dedicated memory on the card. Uh, I can see when the DOS is putting that, that is recognized. So that should not be an issue. And uh, it could be related to the video uh, memory management no idea but uh, anyways uh, now I learned that without uh, virtual memory being enabled the DOS card will not boot up properly on the bright side I managed to um, basically reflow the, the thermal paste on the processor which is a good thing it was a long due uh, task and uh, another thing that I'm going to be adding here is just testing, I was just testing this now. I have this uh, very small fan, right? And I'm going to actually um, use, um, what is the name, like a uh, hot, uh, I'm going to use like a uh, hot, gun, hot gun glue, like uh, to put that in place. And uh, it's going to be like this, even though this is a small fan, it is very silent and very powerful, so it should be enough, you know, to cause at least some airflow to remove the hot air from the processor here. The 486 really get, gets really, really hot and uh, it might benefit from it. So it's already done. I just have to hot glue that into place here to avoid vibrations and sorts and uh, should be good to go. So I'm going to do this now. Then I'm going to basically uh, reassemble the whole mess here. So I have to basically uh, recable everything. So it's going to take a while. And uh, well, again, on the bright side, I'm really happy that this actually worked. I, I was really, really worried that the problem could be on the card or even on the Mac itself. And uh, it turned out to be just a silly configuration that uh, it probably is documented somewhere. It's just something that I didn't know. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. I'm just going to... Put this little guy here in place, close up everything, and uh, reassemble or recable re everything back in its place. And then I can uh, finally make the video showing this amazing card working. So this is how it's, uh, is it going to look like. So this is the mini fan assembled. So the idea is to blow some air into this area here uh, instead of uh, removing the hot air it's going to blow some air here because uh, removing it is not going to have anywhere to go anyways so there is no 
exhaust uh, vent hose in this case so again like there is not much I can do with that but uh, this little vent this little fun at least will maybe cool this area a little bit more so the 486 processor is going to basically be lodged in this hole here so it's basically inside of the heatsink of the power PC processor here so it should work and uh, I'm going to see it so it's very firm this here basically like a hot glue did the trick and uh, it's just hot glue so if I need to remove this uh, in the future it's very easy so it's not gonna damage the board or anything like it and that's it so I'm now going to reassemble everything so this is the board I'm going to put everything in place close the case and basically I'm done okay so after that major headache and a little bit of uh, you know, I'm scared to be honest. I was really worried about this, uh, by the way. Like uh, I told you before, but uh, didn't know what was going to happen if the board was actually defective or something like that. So after uh, disassembling everything and testing and uh, trying to retrace the steps of uh, what I've done uh, because it was working yesterday and then suddenly it wasn't working today. So the only two things that I actually have done was changing the resolution of the monitor to a smaller one so that the camera could actually capture it without too much flickering. And the other thing was uh, disabling the virtual memory. And that was what caused the board to the DOS card to stop working. So again, there should be a reason for that. I have to research a little bit to understand the reason for that but after re-enabling the virtual memory everything seems to be working again so just to show you here virtual memory now is back on as you can see right and uh, I didn't change anything else well uh, during the troubleshooting process I also trashed the preferences from the application itself uh, the DOS card uh, control panel I trashed it and I basically rebuilt the whole configuration from scratch, which was fairly simple, basically. The only things that I needed to do was uh, redefine the uh, virtual disks images here. And, uh, and that was pretty much it. Like everything else is basically default, right? So what I'm going to do now is uh, using the hotkey combination, uh, command enter, I should switch to DOS mode and it should work this time so let's try it there we go it's it was actually booted already because I tested it before right so let me just uh, f uh, shut down the PC and just so you guys can see the booting process of the card so let me just shut down the PC again it's since this is in DOS mode there is uh, no issue in just shutting it down you don't have to properly shut it before so close the control panel here and again the hotkey should bring me to the uh, the hotkey at this point is going to start up the car just like a regular PC and it will start the booting process so that's how it should look like so it's testing the memory so extended RAM is going to be that uh, RAM uh, stick that I have on the card itself which has 32 megs so it's uh, quite a lot of memory actually for a 486 uh, DOS PC right so uh, I modified the uh, booting options so that I basically now have two options to boot from so I have either DOS or Windows right so if I choose DOS then of course I enter into DOS mode and if I choose Windows well guess what I go into Windows 95 so let me start with DOS so I can show you the uh, for example Doom I only going to demonstrate Doom because this is by far the most, um, let's say, uh, popular game that people normally want to see working on DOS machines. So I'm just going to go for that. So let's boot into DOS. So there I am, right? At this point, everything works. So if I add a CD-ROM here, for example, it, it is going to be readable by the DOS. So everything pretty much works. Uh, I'm going to CD to uh, drive D now because that's where all my games are. So if I do a deer here, I get basically all my games uh, listed. So I have Monkey Island, I have uh, 
Goonies and uh, Duke Nunkin 3D and Dune and a whole bunch of other games. One of them being Doom. So let's go into Doom's directory. And from there, just type Doom and enter. And it should basically start up the game. So it is starting up. So it takes a while, you know, for Doom basically to check everything. There's like this put up process. Right after it finishes, there you go. So you have sound as you can hopefully hear, right? So this is the sound blaster basically uh, kicking in. Uh, I have to adjust the monitor here just a little bit, it's out of center as it, as it is right now. It's just because Doom, I think, changed uh, the resolution. Okay. So as you can see, the sound is very good, very clear, right? So it's not emulated. We have an actual Sound Blaster card in the board. So let's uh, start a new game here. So I'm too young to die. I don't have a joystick, so it just is really more for demonstration. So I do have a mouse here. So I'm basically using the mouse, right? As you can see, it actually flows fairly smoothly. Like uh, it is in maximum graph. Uh, mode right so with all the sounds and everything so as you can see like it, it really flows very smooth uh, if you realize that this is an actual 486 so it is really good like very very playable and uh, that's really like a thrill you know to to go through and especially with the proper joystick or such All right so so as you can see the graphics are okay like uh, right again this is a 486 without any uh, dedicated graph card or anything like that and it's uh, that's basically how it goes All right so that's the demo that I wanted to basically show you so I'm going to quit the game now it really works flawlessly, like no major issues or anything, like it just flows very, very well. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start up Windows 95 and uh, we pick from there. So let me switch back to C and uh, let's try Win. It should boot up onto Windows now, I think. So, uh, Going back to the problems that I had here, there was a lot of good things actually out of it. So one of them is that I uh, I added uh, the thermal paste into the processor, something that I should have done like a while ago. And the other thing is, so, so there are windows booting up. The other thing is that I added that little fun, uh, you know, pointing to the processor. So I think that should be, that's the windows, uh, you know, chime sound, which works again, very good. So, by the way, this guy's connected to the internet. So I don't think we can actually type 2020 here. So it has to be like uh, 1920. Yeah, I think it only goes up to, oh no, it does have 2020. So 2020 and uh, so today is October 24th. Let's just make this right. And the time is one, it's actually 2.32 now. And apply. And yeah. So we have uh, basically Windows 95 fully functional here. So all the, you know, the sounds and everything else works. I can actually run games uh, from the Windows 95 as well. And uh, so I have programs here. So as you can see, it's very responsive and it works really, really well. Um, so let me see here what I have that I can demonstrate. So yeah, we do have like solitaire and stuff like that. Uh, I don't have like, uh, for example, uh, office installed or anything like that. I could have, I don't. Uh, it's just that uh, normally I'm going to boot into DOS anyways. But uh, just to show you here, like if I start up Solitaire, right? So it's, uh, 
as you can see it flows again very smoothly like uh, it's not like there is a lag or anything like that it just goes really really good so yeah that's that's what I wanted to show you so the, the thing that I mentioned before about the only thing that uh, uh, Windows 95 works just great and again the card wasn't designed to work with a graphical environment yeah, that's the name like DOS compatibility card it's not Windows compatibility card but as you can see Windows works just fine right just at, as it should in a 488 uh, 86 machine anyways the thing here is with the card for some reason uh, whenever you try to shut down Windows and I'm going to show you what happens it basically like uh, it, it doesn't go through the whole process so if I say uh, shut down you hear the shutdown chime and uh, and then you have a problem as you can see right so it's either that or it's just like uh, it sticks to that uh, you know it's Windows is shutting down but you never actually get that image that should say it's not safe to turn off your computer probably because this is uh, a card instead of an actual PC so it's not really prepared to handle that Windows is not prepared to handle that uh, I don't really care the only uh, thing that bothers me is that every time that this happens and uh, so it's going to stick in that screen there it's not gonna go anywhere right and if I uh, restart the PC uh, the, the, the DOS card it's going to tell me that uh, you know the Windows hasn't uh, shut down properly so you should uh, verify the disk and blah 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 which is no big deal again but uh, it's a little bit annoying uh, other than that it just works and it works really really well no uh, problems with compatibility like all the games that I tested just works out of the box you don't have to do any special configurations or anything like that the Sound Blaster card works flawlessly for most games that I tested like I didn't see any problems well to be honest to all of games that I tested I didn't see any problems uh, at all uh, sound related I mean um, yeah you don't have a dedicated gar graphics card but uh, again for the games from that era is not uh, really a big issue right and uh, for anything else other than that like uh, probably should be using an actual uh, PC instead of um, just a card inside of a Mac that's how I feel about this so that's what I wanted to show you guys it was a bit of an adventure actually uh, because of all the trouble that uh, <laughs> I end up uh, uh, seeing here but I'm very pleased with the result uh, really really pleased uh, and relieved to be really honest and uh, just very glad to know that this card is working flawlessly as it should so going back to the Mac here again command enter brings me back to the Mac and from here I can just basically like shut down the PC and that's it PC is now shut down right so that's basically what I wanted to show you guys so hopefully you enjoyed that it's a very interesting card very useful card and uh, again not very easy to get a hold of it um, the other in the next video I'm going to demonstrate the Apple II card that I have in a Performa that is uh, behind me so I'm going to show you that it works similarly to the DOS card so basically you have like a hotkey that enables and or triggers the Apple II card in the in the Mac and uh, again it's not emulated you actually have a whole Mac uh, Apple II inside or built into the card and uh, it's really really interesting in that sense so I'm going to demonstrate that as well uh, in the next video that I'm going to publish so again hope you guys enjoyed that and uh, I'm basically uh, done here for today cheers